Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. It's tough being uh, right after coffee hour, snack hour, and I know it's a little warm in here, uh, but I really appreciate you guys coming. I looked at my title and I realized I must seem very excited to be here because there's a lot of explanation points in my uh, slide title. Um, so excited to kind of spend the next 40 minutes with you guys. So so uh, this is Apache Zeppelin, um, and I want to thank you all for sort of going out a little bit on a flyer and looking at a, uh, learning about a technology that I think is a really exciting Apache project uh, that is bringing some new ideas uh, to the open source data notebook field, uh, and so and that's Apache Zeppelin. Um, I think I also really like Apache Zeppelin because I thought they had a great logo, so always like that. So I want to jump into the presentation, but before I do, uh, briefly let you know who I am. So I work at Open Source Connections, and we're a search consultancy uh, whose mission is empowering search teams. And what that means a lot of the time is that we're working with search teams and we're working on trying to get them to collaborate with each other better. And we're often working to try and break down some of the barriers that exist inside of organizations. Um, because as I'm sure you know, search is very much a team sport. It's not an individual sport. Uh, and so trying to break down barriers is part of what made me find Apache Zeppelin. Um, I was just adding it up. I've been a member of the Apache Software Foundation for more than a decade, and I co-authored the first book on solar back in the mid-2000s, if you can imagine that. Um, this is my first time to Berlin Buzzwords, and I'm very excited to be here because I love that the themes of scale and stream are a big part of building a really great search experience. So thank you very much for coming. I'll be here for the Mices conference on Wednesday as well, so look forward to meeting more of you. So, why should you look at Apache Zeppelin, right? If you look at that Google Trends analysis between Jupiter and Apache Zeppelin, it, it appears to sell a very daunting story, right? Uh, quick show of hands, how many people use Jupiter? All right. How many people are all, uh, is everybody familiar with the data notebook, what that means? Okay. Mostly, I'll, I'll give a real quick uh, uh, intro to it in a moment. But Jupiter is the 800-pound gorilla of the open source data notebooks, right? And you can see that there's been a lot of interest in it. While Zeppelin has been a challenger and sort of been bumping around with a little bit of interest, uh, both projects have actually been around for quite a few years. Um, and so I'm hoping to kind of show you some reasons that you might want to go take a chance on the red line instead of the blue line. I think that one of the things so one of the things that really led me to Zeppelin is I feel like Jupiter has maybe missed a little bit the point of data notebooks, right? It's a very powerful tool for letting non-programmers start interacting with data, right? Able to load CSV, able to step write some basic code, share things, right? Work in, an, work in sort of a friendly web environment. But I think that that mentality that I am a data scientist or a business analyst or I'm doing some sort of data project in isolation is really thinking from 10 years ago, not thinking of today, right? Where um, the value of a data notebook is not just in organizing your thoughts and making things reproducible, but really in the sharing your ideas and facilitating discussions across multiple groups of people in a world where typically we don't all work together in the same office, we might be in different locations, we might be in different time zones, we have different sets of skills, and we need a way of coming together sort of on the same level to talk about data and what we're trying to accomplish. So, uh, so the value of these data notebooks is breaking down those barriers. So standard clip art type image right there. But you know, I can personally attest 
having visited many organizations where I see the data science, data scientist, data science team very much separated off in one corner over here and the rest of the organization somewhere else. Your search team, your data engineering team, the people managing the ETL pipelines, they're very, very separated. And what happens that I often see is your data science team builds capabilities and skills and technologies and platforms that go in one direction, say lots of Python, lots of R, right? Lots of those sorts of tools. Whereas maybe the engineering team is using Java or Scala or maybe lots of .NET or other, other languages, right? And so what happens is when the data science team comes up with a great new algorithm change or maybe a way of enriching our data to make it more usable to solve problems, they'll come up with those designs, but then we basically throw them over the wall and have to rebuild them from scratch as part of the engineering team. And I think it's because these two groups are so separated. And Jupiter, by virtue of sort of being a very Python specific, very, I just kind of run it in my laptop or in my little environment, not really meant with sharing as a first class concern, continues that bad habit of separating different teams instead of helping people collaborate. So here's you know, what I hope is part of the solution. So Zeppelin helps me foster collaboration because it removes some of the barriers between teams uh, to sharing. And today I want to show you a couple of different features uh, and spend some time talking about them and then see if maybe any of this is a good fit for your team, okay? I'm going to try and make sure to leave plenty of time at the end for questions, but you're also welcome to shout them out as we go, okay? So, so. Um, I wasn't sure how many people would show up at this conference with laptops, but I went ahead and put up a Zeppelin uh, instance uh, that is public. Uh, it's shared with everybody, so be kind and don't delete things. Uh, I'll leave that up for a couple of days, and I'll tweet the URL after this if anyone wants to play with some Zeppelin and interact with it, okay? So we're going to look at a couple of things uh, this morning. So we're going to do the Spark Hello World, which for those of you who aren't familiar with what a data notebook is, it's pretty self-explanatory. You'll, you'll, you'll understand it. And for those who've used Jupyter, right, it'll show you sort of how similar in many ways these two technologies are. But then I want to show you how um, Zeppelin uh, was built with the idea that there's many different coding languages that people want to use. And so it supports sort of a variety of different languages for manipulating data. And then, of course, for anyone who is a hardcore data scientist, right, they're going to say, I'm not going to shift my platform until you give me Pandas, right? So uh, we'll dem I'll demonstrate how Pandas works well inside of Zeppelin. Cron, to automate some features, is one of my favorite things. And then uh, touch on how do we manage our notebooks if we're starting to share them in a more team environment? How do we do revisions and manage them and share them around? Uh, and then I'm going to show off the solar interpreter uh, and then show you some examples of some visualizations like what you might have done in Jupyter, done in Zeppelin just to kind of whet your appetite. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, hopefully live coding will work. How's that screen? OK, excellent. Thank you very much. All right. So, so OK, so let's go ahead. And I'm just going to go ahead and grab the basic Hello World demo that comes with Zeppelin. All right. So Zeppelin, unlike Jupyter, Zeppelin was originally built with the idea that we need a better interface for doing Spark. People use Spark here. Right, and Spark can be kind of a pain to submit the job, edit it, right? It can be a little bit cumbersome. So Zeppelin really was started with the idea that um, you would be uh, running Spark 
right, as a first-class citizen. And so I'll go ahead and I'm just going to run all these paragraphs. And this may look very similar to those of you who've used Jupyter, which is here is a paragraph of text that gets rendered and displayed. And I've already run this, so it runs pretty fast. But you can kind of see, do you see that the code is actually being submitted to Spark, being run, and we're displaying the output, right? And I can actually go ahead and change this code right here on the fly. So I'm going to go ahead and resubmit that change, and we should see. Nope. No debugging because the print statement ran inside of Spark, of course. Get, that's what I get for trying to change it on the fly. So we're running right here just a simple Spark job to grab a data file of banking information, right? And we build a data frame, sort of standard data frame, and make it available. Now what's nice is that often the person who is creating these complex data frames and loading the data from CSV or wherever we're getting the data is not the person who wants to look at that data and visually work with it and identify it, right? So the great thing about Zeppelin is it gives us an environment where we can bring together multiple techniques together. So here is an example. I'm going to go ahead and... In, in the Zeppelin world, you have this sort of percent SQL or percent Spark or percent jo uh, Python or percent SQL that tells you, hey, this block of text is all SQL. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. And you can see it ran, and there goes my SQL queries. And obviously, we can build some basic analytics, cap uh, some basic sort of user inputs and forms, right? Let's say I'm only interested in... Oops, I'm only interested in looking at people up to age 25. And there you can see I've changed around my report. I can also look at my data in various ways. So here is a tabular format, right? There's a bar chart, pie chart, all sorts of different ways of visualizing them. And this is one of the things that I liked about Zeppelin was that the idea of visualizations was, was sort of came as part of the package, right? You can extend it with matplotlib and all of the other sort of tools that you may have used in, out of Jupyter. But Zeppelin says, hey, we understand how to visualize things. And many different sources of data can be visualized through these tools. And so there's lots of different. I'll show you some great visualizations at the end of this. Here's another little example, right? I can go ahead and, uh, you know, put in some structured data. So that's cool, right? That's kind of Jupyter-like and kind of basically what a data notebook typically does. Um, but, you know, it can be nice to help me share, in, uh, share information, right? So I'm going to go back to my bar chart here. And so link this paragraph. And now I've got a unique link right here that I can deploy. So Zeppelin is definitely heavier than Jupyter, right? Like, there, it, you know, you wouldn't necessarily run it on your laptop, right, if it's just you. So there's a little more work to deploying it, but it also means that it makes it really easy. I can take this URL, I can tweet it, I can email it to it, and someone else can jump in and come and see this, uh, this report. And they can manipulate and mess around with it. You can see here we're changing the data right right there, and it's querying underneath. And this could be great if you want to expose some knobs and dials for playing with the data to somebody, but maybe you don't want to give them the raw SQL statements to manipulate, right? Make sense, folks? So, so yeah, so that's uh, one of the, the, the things that I really like uh, about Zeppelin is this idea that I could share individual reports, drop them into an iframe, you can also go ahead and you know, take the entire report and make it, uh, you know, the entire web page and make it a report and then just share the link of the entire web page and people can pull that up as well. So, so sharing, so that's kind of the quick hello world for Zeppelin. Let me, there we go, we'll go back to default. 
Um, uh, that's sort of the quick hello world on Zeppelin. So, so I earlier talked about um, the fact that Zeppelin supports multiple languages, right? Right here, you're looking at Scala, right? This is just Scala code right here. But just to prove to you that we can uh, run multiple languages, here is hello, war hello world in four different languages. So I'll uh, go ahead and, right, there's my Groovy, right? So I can write code in Groovy. I can write code, obviously, in Python. I even have a shell interpreter, which is always fun. I can do ls minus alh and you know, look at your keys. And there's a bunch of security credentials you can add to that. And then there is, and you'll notice it runs a little slower because there is my Spark job, right? So that's like four different languages that you can play with. Um, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, Zeppelin really started out focusing on the Spark and being an interface of Spark, but then lots of people wanted Python and R. Uh, so those are both um, sort of languages that have full support throughout Zeppelin. Okay. Um, and then there's a bunch of other languages. So, so, uh, so that, 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 that's okay, right? Uh, let's go ahead. And let's look at that original Hello World that I showed you in um, the Spark version, right? Let's go ahead and re-implement it in, um, in, in, in Python using Pandas, right? So uh, I'm running this as a Docker image, so I have no data in it. So I'm going to go ahead and just run a shell command and go and grab some data off the internet and drop it into my local environment. And then, you guys can see that, yeah. So, uh, and then we'll go ahead and we're loading all of the data into Pandas, right? So this should look very familiar to, to those of you who've worked with Jupyter and Python, you know, use Pandas a lot. All of that is acceptable to here. But you notice here's sort of a not particularly pretty output, right? Uh, sort of just the print to the, the console that, that Python does. But we can go ahead and because we've because um, Zeppelin understands that a Python or a pandas data frame is a data frame, we can go ahead and we can use SQL statements against it. So I'm going to go ahead and just run some SQL statements. And there my data comes back in a nice, pretty way. So there's a whole bunch of data, right? So technically, what I was running was the Python SQL interpreter under the covers, but it's smart enough to figure out, yes, that's a SQL statement. I know what the rates object is, and that rates object was created above and now accessible to here. And so if I scroll down, here you can see, do these uh, two SQL Statements look pretty familiar, right? They're the same one from the Spark one. However, instead of uh, selecting from the bank data structure, I'm grabbing the one that I loaded in Pandas, the Python one. So let's go ahead and let me prove to you that it works. And so there we're loading up data there. And again, the same SQL syntax here, but instead of going against our Spark cluster with Spark SQL over that big data frame, we're just working with our local data. So the point of this is to sort of highlight that you know, no matter how you approach data, whether you approach it from the Python CSV, and I'm going to use Pandas and NumPy and tools like that to be manipulating it, or if I need to bring out the big guns and go to Spark, I can do that in the same data science notebook. Okay. So this probably, though, brings up some questions like security and like access to data, et cetera, right? So uh, I'm not going to go super deep into it, but you notice that I'm logged in to this version of Zeppelin as an anonymous user. So one of the things that I liked about Zeppelin over Jupyter was the idea that in a lot of environments, setting up access controls, right, we want these people in this LDAP group to have access to this database, 
right? And you know, uh, in the Jupyter world, you're often just giving people like, here's the, here's the connection string and just make your own connection to the database. But in the Zeppelin world, we can go ahead and set up credentials for people that are backed by Active Directory. We can set up single sign-on. You can have access to different interpreters or different notebooks, depending on who you are. You can have private notebooks. You can have public notebooks that you share around. So all of the, like, who is messing with what data and how are they messing with it is sort of thought about in the, in the Zeppelin environment. The other thing that is also thought about in the Zeppelin environment is that in this sort of very simple demo that I'm giving, right, when I create a rates object right here, it's accessible from all my other notebooks, right? And it's actually accessible from anyone who messes. It's a global variable, right? But I can set it up where my objects are specific to me. So if we're in a shared environment where you're loading up a rates object, I'm loading up my own rates data, we wouldn't want them to collide together. And so it takes care of all of, all of that. So, so, um, so authentication, authorization is sort of a first class citizen and is all carefully thought out. Um, and yeah it addresses a lot of people's concerns about, hey, here's all the data, go explore and do what you want to do. So, uh, so let me show you something else that I, find, uh, that I find often very useful. So cron, right? We all remember, do you have a question? Okay. We all remember cron, right? It's a great tool, right, for running processes. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn cron back on. And so Zeppelin supports a very simple cron way of running a notebook on a periodic basis, OK? And so I'm going to go ahead and run this guy, and we'll see what our counter says. Oop. Sigh. This was working for some Python. All right, who could tell me what my typo is? Invalid syntax. Two. two. This version of Zeppelin is 2.7. The new version coming out is three, and I am looking forward to that. So what did I do wrong? Hmm. All right, I think I know what I did wrong. So these are all the interpreters that Python, that, that Zeppelin knows about, right? Spark and Markdown and Angular and you know, Cassandra and Elasticsearch and JDBC. These are all the things that I can connect to, right? Uh, and so I think I maybe didn't know. I don't know why that's not working, but I don't want to uh, drag you through it. So I'll just go ahead and leave that in. So. So let's go ahead and try one more thing, which is let's go ahead and um, look at some revision control. So here's, let's just say here, I'm pulling down this bank file, right? Uh, one of the things that is a challenge in Jupyter is how do I track my changes? Because unfortunately, all of this code that lives inside these notebooks is in a big JSON blob, right? And it's nice because I can do things like, uh, download or export this this notebook and and send it to somebody and they can load it up into another Zeppelin and get their data, right? But it makes sort of diffing any code changes very difficult if you're just using Git on the file system. So um, let's uh, so version control. So I'm gonna go ahead and. So Zeppelin supports Git, right? But it also supports just pointing at S3 and MongoDB and uh, like five or seven other different systems to store the notebooks in as a source control system um, because it ends up doing, and you'll see it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make a change. Let's say we want to only look at the top 10, right? 
right like that. So I'll go ahead and commit that. And if you're a developer, you're probably looking at that little interface and thinking, eh, it's not like what I get out of uh, Git, but it's a lot better than not having any revision control, right? And I can go ahead and, let's see, where's my compare? So I'm going to go ahead and compare these two and scroll down. And what it's going to show me is every single paragraph that's in my notebook and then tell me if there's differences and then it shows me there's sort of a diff, okay? It's, it's not great, right? Uh, it could be better, uh, but it's a lot better than trying to diff these notebooks without any sort of visual help. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the version control. And I can kind of jump back and forth and look at, you know, this was the version with the top 10, and then this should be putting me back at, there it is, my version with the top 20, okay? So the more you wanna share these notebooks, the more you want lots of people to play with them, obviously the more important version control comes so that you know who's got the latest and which one to work with, so. Uh, all right, so let me go ahead and pull up one of the interpreters. So, so, far, so far, I pretty much just showed you code running in a notebook, right? And that's pretty much what Jupyter has as well. So the other idea that they have is I briefly showed you a list of all the different interpreters that you can use with Zeppelin. Here's sort of a long list of them, right? BigQuery, Cassandra, JDBC. The more you work with a disparate set of systems that you want to get data and pull from, the more interesting Zeppelin becomes because you can centrally manage all the connections to all your data stores uh, via Zeppelin, and the people who are working with the data don't need to know that, don't need to understand how you actually get to the data. They just need to know that it's available. And so let me show you an example. So this is a solar that's out on a hosted provider. Uh, has a very long, complex URL, and that URL periodically changes. But because uh, I only have to update my, um, my interpreter settings, right, then, then anyone using this doesn't need to know about those changes to the connection strings. So, and then I'm going to go ahead and this is a streaming query out of Solar. Not sure if anybody's looked at that. Um, I know that there's another talk uh, today Amrit is providing on uh, streaming uh, Solar queries. But I'm sending this big block of text, which is going out and looking over, what is that? A million rows of data and aggregating them to find duplicate records. I'm basically looking for duplicate records. And so, and show me anyone who has a duplicate record. It's going to take a while because it's sort of a big, intense streaming job, but I can mess around with that inside my web notebook here. I didn't have to install Solar locally. I didn't have to install any of the client libraries or anything else locally, right? I could just pull this tool up, and there we go. I got 1,544 nulls and then a couple of records with three, you know, and so I can mess around with my data here. Let's see. Any of these interesting? Yeah, so you can see, uh, I don't know, stacked is going to be a little more interesting. There we go, right? Ooh, I keep, uh, got to watch how much I click in the UI. Yeah. You can see that there's a visualization. So, uh, so the idea behind these different interpreters is I can just, from this tool here, go out and write a SQL statement against a database. I can connect to an Elasticsearch and do Elasticsearch queries. I can do Cassandra queries, right? And all of the interpreters basically implement the basic syntax of any of those tools um, uh, to, to do their querying. So. So that's an example of a slightly unusual interpreter, Solar, um, uh, JDBC, and those are what people typically use. So, 
So lastly, and then just to kind of tell you a use case of using this tool, let me see. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and import an example. There we go. Yep, the wrong one. So I just imported a blob of JSON from another Zeppelin that from a project we did two years ago. And in this project, right, we had built a search index and we didn't really have a good logging platform and we didn't really have a good reporting, but we knew we wanted to start looking at what are the slow queries and, you know, over the last 30 days, over the last seven days, right? And so the thing that I found really useful about Zeppelin was that we were able to point it at, uh, in this particular case, uh, it was a solar index, which was where we were just storing that data. And I was able to put together very quickly a bunch of different queries and dashboards. And then we shared this around. And so we were able to look and understand what the query behavior was. Um, we had some pretty charts about how long the query times were taking on average, what our click rank position was, Right, So we kind of put this all together in Zeppelin and then worked with the business, say, okay, is this the information you're looking for or can we fix this or what do you want to do, right? So it worked great. We used it for about three weeks and then they said, okay, this looks great. We're going to re-implement these different reports in our Tableau environment, right? What was great was that the people who were building the reports in Tableau weren't starting out from scratch. We could point them to what we'd done in Zeppelin, and they were like, oh, great, now I know exactly how to build my reports in Tableau at a, you know, integrated with their entire enterprise with all the roll-ups and other things that they wanted to do. So, so this was a really, uh, a really, you know, this was a really quick and fast way of prototyping something, and then, you know, we built the production system later. So the last thing I just want to leave you with, uh, and um, is, let's see if this link comes up. So I've showed you pretty much the basic out-of-the-box ones, but there's actually a lot of uh, other visualizations that are available. So Zeppelin has a package management library called Helium that actually packages up interpreters and visualizations and all the JavaScript, and you can install them. And so Joel Bernstein's been doing a lot of interesting work to take those solar streaming expressions and build visualizations on top of them. So those, there are some basic ones, right? But there are some more interesting ones. We can go ahead and do visualization based on mapping. We can do some really sophisticated scatter plots and vector plots. There's our pretty SQL aggregations, maybe some you know, heat map kind of stuff in here, linear regression. So, so I think the, the, so what I'm trying to leave you with here is the idea that there's a you know, pretty significant depth of the types of visualizations that you can do. And if you notice, there's these just little extra boxes here. These were all installed into the running uh, Zeppelin via this Helium package management tool that they've been working on. So, so there's lots of interesting analytics inside there. So, so to kind of wrap up, where's my, to kind of wrap up or recap. So Zeppelin is meant for teams that want to share ideas, right? Uh, for a one person project, maybe a little heavier, right, for that. Um, and it is really interesting when you have lots of different languages that you want to work with, right? R and Python and Scala and Groovy and all these other different languages. And multi-data sorcery environments, multi-data source environments where there's information locked up in a lot of different data stores and you want to get access to them and you want to be able to manage that access, put permissions on them, put limitations on how much data they might be allowed to access. Um, there's a big release that's been bubbling around for probably a, a year now, 0.9. I showed you 
Uh, and in this big release, there's uh, much more sophisticated clustering. So you can have a cluster of Zeppelin servers, and it doesn't matter which one you're working on. Uh, the Helium visualization stuff is, I think, going to be really finely baked, baked, right? Uh, and then um, I've heard room, uh, there's some new interpreters, like a terminal. So you can jump onto a box and just, it, it's like you're working on the terminal, but you're just doing it through a web page. Or uh, the other feature that I've heard is that, that there's some work on potentially two people editing the same note at the same time and being able to see who's working on that. So those are kind of the big things. So thank you. So thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, just more uh, curiosity. Let's consider that I have Spark that processes part of the um, of the data, and I create a virtual table. I have my pandas that also create some variables. Can I then mix the both sources together or not? Yes, sort of. So uh, <laughs> the thing that got me excited about Zeppelin was when I was like, oh, I'll query Elasticsearch, get the data back, and then I'll write it to Cassandra, right? But what you have to remember is that Zeppelin itself is just a web app, right? So the interpreters and things that go get that data and bring it back, you're working in that environment, right? Now, Zeppelin's got a lot of hooks where uh, as long as you're working through Spark, right, you can use both languages. And in fact, in here, in, this, in the tutorial, they have a little demo here. Um, I think it's in this R, which demonstrates creating a data frame, yeah, so right down here, we're creating a data frame using Scala or Spark, right? And in R, we're reading back from it, right? So as long as both languages are speaking data frames in Spark, so PySpark and Spark R or you know, something like that, then you're manipulating it. And all of that work is happening in your Spark cluster, not in your little Zeppelin web app. So. And how is the, um, in Jupyter, you have a very nice way to do graphs and to prepare everything. How is it integrated in here? Yeah, so pretty much uh, there was been a big push to kind of support Python uh, in the most recent one. So I think I can, you know, so here's matplotlib. Again, I gotta save that. So there is, right, there's my matplotlib. Uh, all of these sort of plotting tools that you can use in Jupyter also run in here. And in fact, we're using the same IPython interpreter in the back to render everything, so. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, one over there. So, uh, uh, since we now heard uh, what is uh, all the ways in which Zeppelin is better than Jupyter, why do you think it's not used that much? So I think one reason why it's not used a lot was that um, I don't think it's particularly well known and it was primarily distributed as part of Horton data platform or and cloud, both Horton and Cloudera uh, did some work on it um, and it was part of their distributions and it was all wired into you know, all of that authentication, everything that those products gave, right? Um, I think that most people, though, are saying, well, if I'm a data scientist and I go to school, I learn Jupyter, I learn Python, you know, they, they're not really exposed to some of these other big data type, you know, type tools. Um, I don't know why it's not more widely used. I mean, I think that it didn't support Python until sort of last year really well, right? And I think that was a big barrier to entry. Um, I know that there's a fair number of companies that actually bundle Zeppelin in as part of their product. So you may be using Zeppelin as part of a product, you just don't know it 
because they've sort of wrapped it and white labeled it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 meant with that like team orientation and enterprise access controls, right? And I think most people, when they're thinking I'm a data scientist, are like, well, just give me the CSV files and I'll go work in the corner over here. And Jupyter does that really well. So, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. There's so. another question here in the center. Uh, I remember I, I have used uh, Zeppelin like two years ago, and at that time, when we want to integrate Zeppelin with uh, Spark, we have to install like Tori to enable this integration. Does it now uh, now like integrate it automatically, or we still have to do that this kind of setup? So they defi there's definitely the documentation has gotten better, and there's a lot more packaging and separate processes. So um, I haven't had any problems with Docker run Zeppelin and then going into the interpreter and putting in my Spark Master, right? Uh, and it's worked perfectly fine. So um, you know, there's the interpreter. You can see it's set up for local use, right? But messing around with that has worked out well. Um, they've done a lot to like separate all the packages so you can support all the variations of Spark. And I think they've gotten rid of some of the older ones as well, which has helped the stability. Because that was something that I experienced a little bit when I first started using Zeppelin was like package management dependency hell and getting all the right versions of everything to work together. That I think has gotten better. Maybe also because Spark maybe isn't changing quite as quickly as well. So, uh, another question is: uh, Let's let's take the rest offline. We've used up the time. Thanks yep. for the questions. Uh, I'm sure yep. Eric is around. Yep, I will be happy. I'll be around. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, I will tweet that URL. And uh, uh, if you want to kind of play with Zeppelin, uh, and yeah, take a look, see at it. Might be the tool you need to collaborate better with. Thank you. Speak again. Thank you, Eric.